The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I begin by echoing the comments that we heard in this chamber earlier this week following the, the sad and untimely passing uh, of our friend and Scottish Conservative colleague, uh, David Hill? David died playing the sport he loved for the Parliament team that he helped to set up. Um, and I know, having spoken to his parents, uh, Roger and Sharon, uh, in the last couple of days, they are understandably utterly devastated and heartbroken, uh, but they are so appreciative of the support they have received from parties across this chamber. Uh, and also thank you to you, Presiding Officer, and the Scottish Parliament team, who have not only helped David's family, but also his friends and colleagues that were with him when this tragic ag accident occurred. So thank you. Presiding officer, yesterday the damning Audit Scotland report was published into this, this SNP government's failure to build two lifeline ferries. Kate Forbes was put forward to respond in this chamber and to the media, but could not say who made the key decision to sign off this disastrous contract. So, First Minister, can you give a straight answer where your Finance Secretary could not? Which minister gave the green light for these ferry contracts against expert advice? First Minister. Uh, firstly, President Officer, can I also take the opportunity to express uh, my shock uh, and distress at the untimely uh, and tragic passing of David Hill. Uh, I think it is a mark of uh, the man that David was that he had such good friends right across the political spectrum in this parliament. Uh, obviously, when he died, he was doing uh, what he loved most. Um, I hope in time uh, that will be some comfort to his loved ones. I uh, had contact personally uh, with David's dad on Sunday and obviously offered uh, all possible help that the Scottish Government uh, can provide. But my thoughts uh, are with Roger, with Sharon and with David's wider family and friends and, of course, all of his colleagues uh, on the Conservative benches. Uh, presiding officer, to turn to the substance of the question, before I come directly uh, to that question, let me say very candidly, uh, the problems with the procurement, uh, or rather the construction, because uh, it's not the procurement, the construction of these ferries, which resulted in delay, cost overruns, uh, and an impact, uh, a very negative impact on island communities, uh, is far from satisfactory, and I think that is putting it mildly. Um, the report that was published by Audit Scotland yesterday is entirely fair and justified. Uh, there are a number of complexities, uh, but these are public contracts, and therefore, of course, the buck stops uh, with the Scottish Government. Uh, Pre-2019, uh, these were issues around the quality of work and progress of work uh, when the yard was in private ownership. Of course, since the nationalisation of the yard at the end of 20. 19 further problems have been identified, the cabling problem being uh, the most significant. And of course, there uh, was additional delay uh, because of COVID. But we remain focused on the delivery of the ferries. And of course, the actions that the Scottish Government have taken uh, have helped to secure jobs, the last remaining commercial shipbuilder uh, on the Clyde. Um, and I think that is important. Turning to the specific question briefly, Presiding Officer, who was Transport Minister at the uh, time in question is, of course, a matter of public record. Uh, that was Derek Mackay. Uh, but of course, uh, this this is a government, and this may be alien uh, to the Conservatives, I understand, but this is a government that operates by collective responsibility. And ultimately, uh, as with any decisions, whether I am personally involved in them or not, uh, responsibility uh, stops uh, with me. And in terms of uh, the documents around uh, that particular decision, uh, many of these documents have been in the public domain for some time. They clearly narrate uh, the issues. Uh, with the lack of uh, a full refund guarantee, but they also uh, clearly narrate uh, the mitigations that were put in place to reduce that risk. Now, these are documents that are in the public domain uh, and available for anybody to review. Douglas Ross. The, the Finance Secretary couldn't tell this Parliament or the media asking yesterday who was to blame, but 24 hours later, the SNP's spin machine has spun into action, and it's the fault of the disgraced ex Finance Minister. So, so let me get this absolutely straight. The First Minister is claiming she had no involvement. The Audit Scotland report confirms that SNP ministers were aware of the huge risk with this project, but carried on regardless. The government, the government she leads, willingly decided to charge ahead against expert advice. 
The First Minister is now trying to blame Derek Mackay, and it all just seems very convenient that the person getting the blame is no longer here. It was the First Minister's government, her cabinet, her decision. So let me ask again. So, so let me ask again. While she is saying the Transport Minister took the decision, what input to that decision did the First Minister have through the government she leads? First Minister. I am genuinely not sure if Douglas Ross uh, listened to a single word that I said. No, no, he didn't. It was him who asked who the individual minister uh, was. I did not volunteer uh, that information. It is a matter of public record who the Transport Minister yeah was at the time of that decision. It is a matter of public record that that was Derek Mackay. But here's the bit, of course, that I know doesn't suit the script that Douglas Ross prepared before he came into the chamber, but here's what I went on to say. And I'm going to repeat it again, just to be absolutely clear. This is a government that operates by collective responsibility. And I uh, am responsible ultimately for all decisions that the government takes. The buck stops with me. I have never tried to shy away from that on any issue. I know that's not how things are done uh, in the Conservative government uh, at Westminster, but that is how things are done here. So perhaps Douglas Ross might want to reflect before his next question on what I'm actually saying here. I am ultimately responsible uh, for all decisions of the Scottish Government. That's why, uh, of course, I am standing here asking the questions. But on the substance of this issue. Um, and as I said, the, the documents are available in the public domain um, and the issues around in particular, because this was a concern that CMAL had expressed about the lack of a full refund uh, guarantee. Uh, those concerns are, are set out in these documents, but so too are the actions that were taken to mitigate these risks. And of course, government then comes to a decision uh, on the balance of risk. Uh, and of course, the documents express the view that the current deal that has been negotiated with FML is the best deal that can be uh, achieved given the financial restrictions the Yard is operating uh, under. So there were three key changes made, and actually this is all set out in the Audit Scotland <coughs> report, an increase in the final uh, payment so that more money was being withheld, that CMAL would take ownership of all equipment, machinery, materials as they arrived at the shipyard, and FML would require all major suppliers to offer a full refund uh, guarantee. These are the changes that the, reduced the risk and of course underpinned the decision uh, that the government arrived at. But I come back to the central point here. Uh, I am not defending uh, the cost overruns, the delay around the construction of these ferries. It is completely unacceptable. But at all points, the motivation of this government has been to save jobs, yeah. save the shipyard and make sure that these ferries, albeit late, uh, and that is a matter of deep regret, can be delivered. And that is what we continue to focus on. Douglas Ross. The First Minister says she takes ultimate responsibility, then throws an ex-minister, a disgraced SNP ex-minister, under the bus. So if we're looking, if we are looking at ultimate responsibility from the First Minister, can she tell us why a key safeguard was removed that could have saved Scottish taxpayers hundreds of millions of pounds? Can she tell us, with her ultimate responsibility, why they started building the ferries when they didn't even have a design agreed? With her ultimate responsibility, can she tell us why Ferguson Marine were given the contract in the first place? And with her ultimate responsibility, can she tell us why there is not going to be a public inquiry into this whole scandal? Because... Because we need this public inquiry, because Audit Scotland tried to get answers, but they couldn't. They said, and I quote, there is no documented evidence to confirm why Scottish Government ministers were willing to accept the risk of awarding a contract to Ferguson Marine, despite CMAL's concerns. We consider that there should have been a proper record of this important decision. First Minister, this is one of the most reckless decisions ever taken by a Scottish Government, so far costing a quarter of a billion pounds of taxpayers' money. First Minister, why can't the body in Scotland charged with scrutinising public spending get a shred of evidence to justify your Government's decision? First Minister. The, who had read Audit, Audit Scotland's report uh, could reach that particular conclusion, but I'll come back to that. But can I say this, first of all? 
If Douglas Ross uh, thinks it is unimportant who the individual minister was, um, and that, as I agree with, the buck stops with me, why was his first question asking me who the individual minister was? Clearly, he must have thought that was important. Uh, I was not intending to come here and do anything other than accept full responsibility. Coming on to the questions, and let me answer them one by one. So on the decision to proceed um, and the lack of the full builder's refund guarantee. That's what I've already uh, run through. Uh, that decision uh, was clearly taken on the balance of risk. CMAL had concerns about that, uh, but a range of actions had been taken and I set out exactly what those actions were to mitigate those risks. And the conclusion in this is in documentation that is publicly available that uh, the deal negotiated uh, was the best one that could have been achieved in those circumstances. Uh, now, the second question I think that Douglas Ross asked me uh, was why was the contract awarded to FML uh, when it was the most expensive? Again, that question is actually answered in the Audit Scotland report. Uh, the review, of course, uh, found that it was the most expensive. I think, if memory serves me correctly, uh, that was known at the time. Uh, but CMAL also assessed the bid as being of the highest quality. So overall, it achieved the highest combined cost and quality score of the seven bids. That was the decision taken at the time. And of course, ministers are not involved in procurement decisions. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, on the question of a public inquiry, we of course have had uh, a, a parliamentary committee uh, look into this issue. We've now had a major Audit Scotland review, but as Audit Scotland itself recommends at page seven, I think, uh, on completion of the vessels, there should be a formal review of what went wrong uh, with a view to learning lessons. So the Scottish Government will consider what form that further review should take. We will consider that carefully and, of course, we will report to Parliament in due course. Douglas Ross. Uh, it's ridiculous. We, we are fortunate in Scotland to have two governments and there's only one of them currently building ships in Scotland that actually <laughs> sail. And that is because of this First Minister's record in government. So let's look again. Ferguson Marine was the most expensive bidder, yet, as the First Minister has just said, was chosen on the basis of quality. Chosen on the basis of quality when ferries are two and a half times over budget. Hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money has already been wasted. There is a five-year delay, at least, and there's still... 175 faults with the ferries that are still being built. This is one of the worst public spending disasters since devolution. And who messed up? Who knows in SNP Seeks at Scotland? Because all, all the evidence is gone. Audit Scotland couldn't get to the bottom of a number of points. The only scraps of paper we have left about this disastrous decision are the old SNP press releases that claim they were saving Scottish shipbuilding. So, First Minister, can I ask, when you visited the ferries in 2016, were the painted on windows not a sign that your decision was an absolute shocker? First Minister. Well, I think what Douglas Ross has demonstrated there is that he has not spent much time actually reading uh, the hundreds of pages of documents that are in the public uh, domain. Uh, there is one issue where Audit Scotland refers uh, to a lack of documentation. I think that is a matter uh, that the government needs to reflect on seriously and will. But there are hundreds of pages of documents. Um, I've referred to many of them already, um, and they uh, would bear uh, some attention, I, I think, from Douglas Ross. Um, I said candidly at the outset, I think this is a deeply regrettable situation. Uh, at the time I visited the yard, of course, it was in private ownership. Assurances were given there about the completion uh, of work and the problems that have led to cost overruns, uh, delays and, worst of all, a negative impact on our island communities is deeply regrettable. At every step, uh, the motivation of the government has been to secure employment, to secure the shipyard and to get these ferries completed. And that is what we will continue to focus on. We will learn the lessons in the Audit Scotland report. We will make sure uh, that all of the recommendations in it are taken forward. Uh, but uh, Douglas Ross may think it is unimportant to have saved 300 jobs and a shipyard. I actually think these things yeah. matter. Yeah. Um, and that is why we will now focus on making sure that that yard it has a positive future.
Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, can I start, like others have, by paying tribute to David Hill um, and send my particular condolences, of course, to uh, his family and friends, but also recognise the uh, wonderful tribute that Jamie Green, uh, who uh, employed and paid to, to David, and uh, my condolences to, to Jamie Green, uh, and in particular all our Conservative uh, colleagues in this uh, Parliament. David was someone that was respected uh, across the political spectrum, and he had uh, friends not just that were MSPs, but let's not forget the many staff uh, the work in and around this Parliament building too. Uh, President officer, yesterday faced with the biggest fall in living standards since rationing, the Chancellor failed to present a spring statement that would make life easier for millions of families. He failed to introduce a windfall tax, he failed to put more money in people's pockets, and he raised the tax burden on millions of families across the UK. He must have been taking lessons on missed opportunities from this First Minister. In her government's budget, the First Minister had the opportunity to tackle the cost of living crisis, but just like the Tories, they failed. Giving households less than £4 a week in a council tax rebate, copying Rishi Sunak's policy, just won't cut it. Will the First Minister accept that the action she has taken so far is not enough to confront this crisis? First Minister. Well, in the Scottish Government's budget, of course, uh, we doubled yep. the Scottish child payment. Game changing, Game -changing uh, for families uh, with children living in poverty. If memory serves me correctly, Presiding Officer, uh, the Labour Party shamefully voted against yeah. that measure yeah. in the Scottish budget. Um, in terms of yesterday's spring statement, um, I think it showed a callous disregard uh, for the misery that people are already facing and the misery that is going only to get uh, much, much worse. Uh, household incomes are about to suffer their biggest fall in more than 60 years. The Resolution Foundation uh, has estimated that an additional, an additional 1.3 million people across the UK, including half a million children, will be pushed into poverty. There was nothing to help the poor uh, and those on the lowest incomes. Uh, and I think it was shameful. I think the most shameful thing about the Chancellor's announcements yesterday is that he squirrelled away money uh, for pre-election yes. bribes, money that could be spent right now to help those in desperate circumstances. His actions yesterday in that regard uh, were disgusting. In terms of the Scottish Government's actions, and we have limited powers and we have limited resources, uh, but due to our wider, long-standing policies. People here already pay less on average in council tax, uh, less in water bills, uh, less in rail fares. Of course, people in Scotland uh, compared to south of the border pay nothing for prescriptions, for eye tests, for university tuition. Additional action uh, in addition to the payment through the council tax, the £150 payment, we have taken the decision to uprate dev devolved benefits by 6% and it's the failure uh, south of the border to do that that's having the biggest impact on low-income families. We've introduced, as I've already said, the Scottish Child Payment, we're investing in the Scottish Welfare Fund, we're increasing the Fuel Insecurity Fund. So we will continue to do everything that we possibly can within our powers and resources. But anybody who is serious about helping the lowest paid would be arguing for demanding powers and resources to be taken out of the hands of Rishi Sunak and his type and put into the hands of this Parliament. Anna Sarwa. We welcome the doubling of the Scottish Child Payment, but it's a plan that predates the cost of living crisis. Over 270,000 children aren't going to benefit, and poverty campaigners say it needs to go further. And the First Minister wants to obsess about power she doesn't have. She's been in government for 15 years. She has power. Use that power to change people's lives. That's what the job is for. So let's look at what she's done with the power she has. Copied Rishi Sunak's council tax rebate, failed to target support to those most in need, increase rail fares and put up water charges for Scottish households. We have published detailed plans on how to confront this crisis, but so far the SNP has not listened. So here's another meaningful action they could take. Scottish water is owned by the Scottish Government. They are currently sitting on a cash mountain of £428 million. So Scottish Labour is calling for not just the freezing of water charges, but a £100 rebate for every household in Scotland. Does the First Minister believe that this money is better off in Scottish Waters Bank account or in struggling families' accounts? First Minister. Consider everything uh, that we can reasonably do to help. But Anna Sarwar said uh, that the Scottish Child Payment uh, doubling, of course, predated the cost of living uh, crisis. That is, of course, one of the reasons why this afternoon, this very day in this Parliament, Shona Robertson will deliver 
a statement accompanying our updated uh, Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, setting out the further actions that this government is going to take to lift children out of poverty, uh, rather than doing as the UK government is doing, pushing more uh, children into poverty. I'm surprised that Anna Sarwar didn't seem to uh, know that. Uh, yes, uh, my party's been in government uh, for some time. That's why in Scotland uh, people don't pay for prescriptions, they don't pay for eye tests, they don't pay to go to university. It's why we've got uh, lower council tax on average than in England and in Labour run Wales. It's why uh, more people pay no council tax at all because we retain the council tax reduction scheme. Uh, and of course, we are using our powers. The doubling of the Scottish child payment is the principal example of that. So we will continue to look at what more we can do. Uh, Anna Sarwar is right uh, to continue to press us to do more, uh, but he'd have more credibility if he didn't also back the retention of these powers over welfare, over public spending in the hands of Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. Until he changes that position, I don't know that many people across Scotland are going to take him seriously. Anna Sarwar. Really officer. That is simply not good enough. People are struggling right now. And as per usual, the First Minister wants to make this a constitutional debate. I hate to break it to her. See whether you voted yes or no, your bills are still going up and you need help from this government. So the First Minister can take action to tackle the cost of living crisis. And let's look at the stories over the last week, the tragic stories from across the country. People stealing fuel canisters in the Highlands. Families turning down fresh vegetables from food banks because they can't afford to turn on the gas cooker. And people digging up their gardens to grow, up their own, grow their own food because they can't afford to buy it. That's why Labour has set out the actions both governments should take. A windfall tax on oil and gas giants to reduce bills by £600. The £200 as a grant, not a loan. And here in Scotland, a £400 support payment to support struggling families. A £100 rebate on water bills and a freeze on water charges and rail fares. That is real help supporting families with over £1,000, a contrast to this government's flagship cost of living policy, which would give families less than £4 a week. When will the First Minister understand she has to do better than this? First Minister. Actually, policy is the Scottish Child Payment, which Anna Sarwar and his colleagues, of course, voted against when the budget uh, came before this Parliament. We will continue to look at everything and anything we can do within the powers and resources that we have. Uh, Shona Robinson will set out further actions when she delivers her statement this afternoon. Um, there is real misery. There is a wave of human misery uh, being experienced right now. It's only going to get worse on that. Anna Sarwar and I uh, do not disagree, and we will continue to do everything we can. But I'm afraid uh, there is a real issue at the heart of this. If you look at the uh, Joseph Roundy Foundation analysis published this morning, uh, those in the lowest income uh, decile are going to see their uh, household incomes cut by almost 6%. Um, the re main reason for that is the failure to uprate benefits by more than 3.1 per cent. Uh, where we have control of benefits here, we have uprated them by 6 per cent. Um, now, the reason we can't do that for the main benefits, like universal credit, for example, uh, is because we do not have the power. And I'm afraid, uh, and it's the same reason why we cannot impose a windfall tax to help with energy costs. It's the same reason why energy costs may uh, remain reserved. Because when it came to a choice between yes and no, Anna Sarwar encouraged people to vote no. And because people voted no, these powers remain in the hands of Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. Uh, and until Anna Sarwar addresses that issue, then we are always going to be limited in this parliament in terms of what we can do. When is he going to wake up and realise that? I move to supplementaries and I call Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. A constituent of mine is a victim of historic forced adoption, whose concerns about confidentiality of victims responding to the Scottish Government consultation she explains that filling in the responses is quite difficult for victims as it brings up a lot of emotion and it has a bigger impact on people filling it in. This could have a significant impact on the responses given and the effectiveness of the consultation. What assurances can the First Minister give my constituent and all victims of forced adoption that any information they give will be confidential and that they will not be identifiable from their responses? First Minister. 
Uh, this is a, a, a really important issue. I also recognise it's an extremely sensitive issue, so I want to thank everybody who has responded uh, to the consultation so far, and I appreciate that it takes a lot of courage uh, to share uh, deeply distressing stories like this. Uh, we are offering a private space for people to come forward to share experiences in complete confidentiality. Um, and I would uh, like to reassure the member's constituent that participants can take part entirely anonymously and no data uh, that could identify an individual will be retained. Uh, we also have a dedicated helpline um, in collaboration with Health in Mind uh, to provide interim support to individuals who want to make a contribution. The closing date for responses is the 20th of April and following uh, this date, all responses will be analysed and considered along with any other available evidence. Myrtle Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, over the past decade, no fewer than four women have died whilst patients on the Morden Ward at Murray Royal Hospital in Perth while suffering acute mental health disorders. Today, the Courier newspaper reports that a fifth patient died on the ward in the same period, but their death and the circumstances have never been made public. First Minister, these patients were in hospital to keep them free from harm, but they and their families have been failed. Why is this happening and what is being done to stop it? First Minister. Uh, these are very serious issues and where uh, lessons need to be learned, uh, they are learned by health boards and uh, where necessary by the government. I am uh, not aware of the detail of the uh, case reported in the Courier today. Um, I will ensure that I become aware uh, of that detail and I am happy to write to Murdo Fraser uh, when I have had the opportunity to do so. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, Hourglass is a 24-7 helpline supporting older people and their families dealing with abuse and neglect. This is the first service of its kind that has just launched in Scotland as a result of a 46% rise in elder abuse calls during the pandemic. Elder abuse is an under-supported and under-reported area, and given these shocking statistics, the Hourglass helpline will be a very welcome resource. Hourglass is funded by the Home Office to provide a service in England. Will the First Minister agree to meet Hourglass and consider providing support for this valuable service in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, services uh, like Hourglass are uh, very important. Uh, elder abuse is awful and, of course, the pressures of the pandemic, uh, I think, are understood by all of us. I'm certainly very happy to have the Health Secretary uh, meet with or talk to Hourglass to see what the Scottish Government can do to support them. Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. My constituents' family have thankfully safely made it to Glasgow from Kiev, including a 68-year-old relative travelling for a Ukrainian passport. They have asked me whether their relative will qualify for the concessionary travel scheme, something that I hope the First Minister can confirm. But more widely, First Minister, what steps is the Scottish Government taking to assist those arriving in Scotland from Ukraine or indeed elsewhere to access all the services and entitlements they should have the right to receive at such a difficult time. First Minister. Um, well, I'm certainly very uh, relieved and pleased to hear that Bob Doris's uh, constituents' family have made it safely to Glasgow. I know they will uh, receive a warm welcome here. I'd be happy to provide uh, any detailed information on the support uh, services that are available, uh, given their particular circumstances. Obviously, we have a proud history of welcoming displaced people and a wealth of experience uh, from previous schemes. Uh, we uh, are working with a range of partners to ensure that wraparound support is in place for all displaced people that are arriving here in Scotland. Uh, the, those who come from Ukraine will have a right to work, they will have access to social security benefits and uh, public funds, uh, and we will be working to make sure people are aware of that and get access to all uh, of those services. Uh, we are standing ready uh, to welcome, uh, I hope, significant numbers of people uh, fleeing uh, the situation in Ukraine. Uh, we were pleased that our super sponsor uh, scheme uh, that we had proposed to the UK government went live uh, on Friday and uh, we have uh, multi-agency efforts uh, in place to provide support. What we need now um, is to see visas begin to be granted in significant numbers so that we can get more people uh, to Scotland and give them the support that they need. Um, and on this issue, finally, um, let me take the opportunity to uh, welcome, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, uh, the Dnipro kids uh, who arrived in Scotland last night. I know they would all rather be at home in Ukraine, but while they're here, um, I think it's uh, something all of us want to do to make sure that they are surrounded by love, care and support. Megan Gallagher. Can I, can I just check, Ms Gallagher, is your card in? Okay. 
Just bear with, bear with us a second. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I refer members to my Register of Interest, as I am a serving councillor in North Lanarkshire. On the 24th of February, the First Minister gave a commitment to explore Christine Graham's suggestion that local authorities should not investigate their own complaints in, relate, in cases relating to child protection. Therefore, does the First Minister agree that an independent national whistleblowing officer should be established for public bodies? And does she agree that those who cover up child protection issues should be reported to Police Scotland immediately? First Minister. Well, I did give the commitment uh, to Christine Graham, um, as uh, the member rightly says, that was uh, just a, a few weeks ago. So I hope she will accept uh, that the consideration of these issues is still underway, and I will make sure, um, as part of that consideration, the proposals she's made today are properly considered. Yep. Question number three, Pam Gossel. The presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that perpetrators of domestic abuse do not go on to reoffend. First Minister. Domestic abuse is an insidious uh, and dreadful crime. It has a devastating impact on victims and it is vital that perpetrators are fully held to account. Um, in partnership with key stakeholders, uh, we are implementing Equally Safe, which is Scotland's strategy to tackle all forms of violence against women and girls. Uh, this aims to prevent violence uh, from occurring in the first place, uh, build the capability and capacity of mainstream and specialist services to support survivors and those at risk, and also strengthen the justice response to victims and perpetrators. As a tangible example uh, of that, uh, we have committed to expanding the availability of the accredited Caledonian system uh, to ensure that more male perpetrators of domestic abuse are directed to services uh, that help challenge harmful behaviours, reduce reoffending, and improve the lives of women and children. Pam Gossel. I thank the First Minister for that response. Growing up as a very young child, I watched victims of domestic abuse come to my mum's shop on her girl street for help. But not enough has changed. Half of the 65,000 domestic violence incidents reported in 2021, 20, 2020 to 21 were committed by reoffenders. Clearly, whatever the government is doing right now isn't working. We need to work together to provide a true deterrent for the horrible abuse. So can I ask the First Minister? Will her government commit to do more on this issue and back my proposals to create a domestic abuse register? First Minister. I mean, these are uh, really serious issues, and I want to uh, ensure that we take them very seriously. Um, on the specific issue of an offender uh, register, uh, obviously we keep the law under continual review. We're always uh, keen and willing to explore any options to reduce crime and reoffending. Uh, so we would uh, be very keen to understand the detail uh, of that proposal and uh, give it due consideration. Of course, all registered sex offenders are already placed on the sex offender uh, register and as such must register with the police as part of those requirements. But I appreciate that will not incorporate all uh, perpetrators of domestic uh, violence. So these things need uh, careful consideration and uh, I certainly undertake uh, to give it that. On the, the broader issues, um, it is uh, definitely the case, and, and I think this is something that should be welcomed, uh, that more people now feel able to come forward uh, when they are victims of domestic abuse or, or sexual uh, violence, and that is to be encouraged. Obviously, sentences uh, for perpetrators are matters for courts, um, and I think it's important that we all uh, recognise that. Uh, but there is a range of work underway to ensure better support uh, for victims, uh, to ensure that those who do commit uh, these dreadful crimes uh, do face up to the consequences of their actions and the Caledonian system that I uh, referred to earlier is an important part of that. Uh, we're also doing more to invest in the support services uh, that victims uh, need and get so much benefit from. So uh, there's a range of work underway, but on this issue, I will remain, the government will remain open-minded uh, to any further proposals that are put forward. Question number four, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what work is being done to extend the Warham Scots welcome to Ukrainians arriving in the UK. First Minister. Well, we are all, uh, all continue to be horrified by the illegal war in Ukraine. Uh, we are ready to extend uh, the warmest of Scottish welcomes uh, to those fleeing the war. We have been working rapidly with a range of partners to ensure that displaced Ukrainians arrive to a place of safety and security. Uh, we have established welcome hubs at key entry points uh, to support people with what they need immediately on arrival, as well as to assess their medium to longer term needs. Uh, we are working with COSLA to provide accommodation, as well as exploring all viable public and private sector housing options, and of course offers from the public, who have generously uh, offered to open their own homes. Fulton McGregor. 
Yeah, I thank the First Minister for that response and for the ongoing work of the Scottish Government in this area. And I would also like to take this opportunity briefly, President Officer, to congratulate my good friend and colleague Neil Gray on his recent appointment as Minister for Ukrainian Refugees. I think that this is also a very fitting appointment because, of course, our two constituencies have a richly shared history, making up the wider Monklands area, and we have both been deeply touched over recent weeks by the sheer magnitude of response of people in both Coatbridge and Christon and their drain shots to this crisis and their tremendous willingness to support those seeking refuge. Can I therefore ask the First Minister, after the stress and trauma of escaping an illegal war, how will the Scottish Government ensure that the welcome hubs that she mentioned support displaced people from Ukraine to find peace and safety here in Scotland? First Minister. The welcome hubs uh, are, are a really important uh, initial part of what we want to offer. So they will assess uh, immediate needs. Uh, they will take a, a multi-agency approach assess those needs, provide wraparound support, um, and that will include having trained uh, staff on call to support people who are experiencing trauma. Uh, the welcome hubs will also be able to begin the assessment of longer-term needs, including, of course, uh, accommodation requirements. Uh, we now have uh, the super sponsor route in place, which is in addition to uh, the Homes for Ukraine route and, of course, the family route. Uh, we have the support uh, ready to be provided here. The bit in the middle is getting the visa applications granted so that people can start arriving in numbers. I'll get uh, an update later today, but yesterday um, the update I had was that there had been uh, over a thousand applications made uh, through the super sponsor scheme um, and uh, just under a thousand, I, I think, in terms of individual uh, matching. Obviously, we are still improving data flows, so there will be some uncertainty around uh, those figures. Uh, what we need to see, though, is a significant uh, speeding up of the, the granting of visa applications uh, in order, as I say, that we can see people come here and start to access the support that we have ready for them on that multi agency basis. Question number five, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that people are able to register with NHS dental practice and receive NHS dental treatment in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. First Minister. It is obviously a priority to ensure that patients are able to access NHS dental care. Uh, of course, we have committed to abolishing dental charges in the lifetime of this Parliament, which will help uh, remove at least one of the barriers to accessing high-quality NHS dental services. To support patient care and access, uh, we recently announced revised payment arrangements for dentists from the 1st of April, which will more closely link payments to the number of patients being seen and treatments provided. This multiplier funding arrangement will see additional investment in dentistry increased by almost £17 million in the first quarter of the new financial year, and that comes on top of the 9 per cent planned increase in the budget for NHS dental services in the coming financial year, and of course the support given during the pandemic of £50. Uh, £50 million financial support for the sector and a further £35 million of PPE. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Many constituents have expressed to me that due to the total lack of NHS provision in their areas, they are left with untreated dental pain and conditions, often missing checkups that can spot life threatening conditions such as. Uh, oral cancer. Does the First Minister realise that she is increasingly not even overseeing a two-tier system? For many people across Scotland, dentistry is effectively privatised already. First Minister. Uh, no, we continue to support NHS dentistry. Um, in fact, uh, we are investing more proportionately than we are seeing uh, south of the border by about 40%. Uh, we have about 40% more dentists uh, per head of population, uh, per 100,000 of the population, uh, than elsewhere in the UK. There are significant challenges uh, because of the pandemic. That is why uh, we financially supported uh, dentists during the pandemic and why we are taking action now uh, to further support dentists. The payment uh, the, the multiplier uh, funding arrangement that I referred to in my earlier answer is extremely important. It has been welcomed by many dentists. Um, I think the BDA have also uh, welcomed the introduction of this. So that recognises the importance of linking payments to numbers uh, of patients and to the treatment that is being provided. So we will continue to ensure that we support NHS dentistry um, and that people have access to, and of course, as I also said earlier on, removing dental charges will also take away one of the barriers uh, that traditionally some people have uh, experienced. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. As, uh, of course, I had my own experience with dental problems <laughs> last week, 
and uh, I'm not directly blaming the First Minister for that. But uh, Douglas, Douglas Thane from the Scottish Dental Association said that decades of underfunding by the Scottish Government has, cleared, has created a toxic environment as dentists battle rising costs and inadequate fees paid by health boards. So can't the First Minister see that her current approach is endangering dental provision for those who need it most across Scotland? First Minister. Well, I know I said earlier on that the buck stops with me. I'm afraid that doesn't include Stephen Kerr's uh, teeth problems. Um, <laughs> I'm just hoping the glue is working better uh, today. Um, but I think I'm going to move on because <laughs> Please do. These, are, these are two important issues for such levity. Um, these are important issues. Uh, there are more dentists. Uh, so if I look you know, where Stephen Kerr's party is in government, uh, the number of dentists uh, per 100,000 of the population was 39.9. In Scotland, it's 55.6, 40% higher. Uh, for this financial year, our government investing in core community dental services is 40% higher. That doesn't remove uh, all of the difficulties, but it does show the foundation we have in place here, which is why the additional investment I'm speaking about is so important, because it recognises these additional uh, problems caused by the pandemic. So we will continue to focus on supporting NHS dentists uh, in order that people across the country can have the access to them that they have every right to expect. Question number six, Ariane Burgess. To ask the first... To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Spring Statement. First Minister. Well, yesterday's Spring Statement uh, was a missed opportunity on the part of the Chancellor to give families and businesses the support they need now in the face of rising costs. It did show callous disregard for the poorest in our society. Uh, despite the largest annual fall in living standards since the 1950s, uh, as confirmed by the OBR, the Chancellor's decisions will mainly assist the better off and provide no real help to those on low incomes, uh, with ever more households left facing uh, poverty. Um, in contrast, the Scottish Government, within our very limited powers and resources in this regard, is taking a range of targeted steps, including, of course, doubling the Scottish Child Payment, uprating uh, our devolved social security benefits by 6% and extending our fuel insecurity fund. Ariane Burgess. Brexit and the volatile cost of oil and gas are playing a massive role in the cost of living crisis, and there was no recognition of this Tory legacy in the Chancellor's statement. What's worse, there was nothing in his statement to help those struggling the most with the rising costs. With the Office of Budget Responsibility warning about the biggest annual fall in living standards since their records began, what can the Scottish Government do to build on what we have already delivered to tackle the cost of living, like free bus travel for young people, free school meals for primary school children, and as you've just said, doubling the child, Scottish child payment? First Minister. Well, I think it's absolutely right uh, to point out the impact uh, of the Chancellor's statement yesterday on the poorest in our society. The Joseph Roundtree Foundation has published analysis this morning that I would recommend every member of this parliament uh, looks at uh, carefully. Uh, the richest decile will see their incomes fall by less than 2%. The poorest decile will see their incomes fall uh, by almost 6%. Um, and that is principally down to the failure to properly uprate uh, benefits. And given that the Chancellor had access to more money, uh, the decision not to do that is disgusting and completely indefensible. Um, I've already set out today the actions that the Scottish Government is taking. Uh, we will continue to look at further actions we can take. Um, and of course, as I said earlier on, uh, Shona Robinson will set out when she delivers uh, the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan later today some further actions that the Scottish Government will take. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Further to the woefully inadequate spring budget from the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the face of fierce cost of living hike, does the First Minister agree that for those on fixed incomes, such as pensioners, many of whom became housebound in these COVID years, uh, during which co heating costs will be devastating, and with one of the worst state UK state pensions, they've got the worst in Europe, and that Anna Sarwar, for example, has to wake up to the position that without with power over pensions and other benefits, mitigation has its limitations. First Minister. Well, Christine Graham is absolutely 100% right. We can't use powers that we don't hold in this parliament. Where we do hold powers, we are using those powers. So taking action, game-changing action, to lift children 
out of poverty. Uh, we don't have control over pensions, uh, but it is the case that there are people we, we tend to talk about uh, the invidious choices that in these circumstances people face between eating uh, or heating their homes. There will be some people in the face of this cost of living crisis who cannot afford to do either. That is the reality. Uh, this government will do everything we can within the powers and resources we have. But as long as so many of these levers uh, lie with a Conservative government at Westminster, we're going to see more of what we saw in the spring statement yesterday. Anybody who really cares about this it would not just be arguing for, they'd be demanding these powers to be taken away from Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson and put into the hands of this parliament as quickly as possible. Mercedes Vialba. Millions of workers are facing a cost of living crisis that they didn't create. The People's Assembly have been organising mass demonstrations up and down the country to make it clear that workers can't pay and they won't pay for this crisis. And campaigners are calling for the introduction of a wealth tax on the richest 1%, which would raise £14 billion a year to help tackle the cost of living crisis and invest in public services. Does the First Minister back this call? First Minister. Yeah, I do think we should see uh, those who can afford it uh, contribute the most. But just like a windfall tax, uh, a wealth tax is not something uh, this government has the power to do. So if Labour want to see these things happen in Scotland, then they can't just talk um, about the ends they want to see. They have to actually equip this parliament and this government with the means to do something about it. It's called making this parliament independent. I will take a general supplementary from Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Government has informed Orkney Islands Council that the island's connectivity plan will exclude lifeline internal ferry services in both Orkney and Shetland. Can the First Minister please explain why her national islands plan does not appear to include the needs of all Scotland's islands? First Minister. Uh, we have been discussing with uh, the island authorities for some time uh, the inter-island uh, ferry services. Uh, we will continue to do that and I will ask the Transport Minister uh, to engage with Liam MacArthur in more detail uh, about what further steps we are able to take. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a short pause before members' business.